first book of um, the Two Towers. Now, if we didn't talk about it at all. I talked about it, I think, in that... Um, video that I had you watch. In the note on the text, the very beginning of the book, the first volume of The Lord of the Rings was published in London, um, 29 July 1954. Okay? So that first volume ends with what? Last chapter. Breaking of the Fellowship. All right? So readers in England then have to wait until November 11th, 1954 to find out what happens after the breaking of the fellowship. Talk about your cliffhanger, okay? Two Towers gets published in November of 1954. Return of the King doesn't get published for almost a year later. So that when you get to the end of, of the Two Towers, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty significant, suspenseful moment, okay? Now you've got to wait nine months. The only thing that's probably similar, is there somebody at the door? The only thing that's probably similar in your lifetimes um, would be what set of books? Really? Okay. See, I was going to say the Harry Potter novels. Because okay. 97, you get 97, 98, 99. The first three are published. And then you have to wait till... Yeah, I think it's 2002 for book four. And then 2005 for book five, 2007 for um, however it goes on, okay? So, I mean, you, you, you've got these cliffhangers. Tolkien takes us, however, how does book... Breaking of the Fellowship ends. So Frodo and Sam set off on the last stage of the quest together. And Tolkien picks up where? So we have <coughs> you have fellowship of the ring ends with Mary and Pippin, right? They run off. Aragorn, Legless, and Gimli kind of run off. Um, they don't really. I'm kind of leading up. Sam and Frodo. And you could say, you know, Boromir, because Boromir runs off after them. Okay? So we see, you know, and then Gandalf's down here because he's dead still. Okay? So Tolkien breaks the fellowship. He's going to take each of these and turn them into narrative or plot threads. So that we're going to follow, when we open this book, uh, The Two Towers, what do we see? Aragorn, Legolas, Gimli, and... Because he's still alive, so that shouldn't actually be there. Boromir. Okay? So we're going to follow them for a while. Then Tolkien's going to take us up to Merry and Pippin. Then we're going to go back down, back down to Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli. Then we're going to go back to Merry and Pippin. And it's only in the second book of the Two Towers that he then takes us to Sam and Frodo. And at that point, he leaves these guys completely alone. So that we then follow Sam and Frodo and their adventures from back here, the breaking of the fellowship, all the way to when we see the remnants of the fellowship break even more. When Sam and Frodo get separated. Okay? And it's only in the return of the king that he starts to weave all these loose threads back together again. So you start with chapter one, the departure of Boromir. Yes? Yeah, okay, so Aragorn hears Boromir's horn, and he goes and runs towards it, and he finds Boromir leaning up against the tree, you know, pulling arrows out of himself, because he's a, essentially become a um, uh, thing you stick pins in for so pin Put pin cushion for um, orcs. And notice what he does. I tried to take the ring from Frodo, he says, page 414. I am sorry, I have paid. What does he mean, I have paid? Okay, but that's not what he's talking about there. I mean, yes, he does do that. He's saying, I did a wrong, and I paid for it. Okay? 
Does he have to tell Aragorn this? So why does he? Honor bound? Yeah, I think it's part of it is honor bound. And again, I think this is a little example of what Tolkien said in that letter about the religious and philosophical ideas kind of working their way in through his revising. This is kind of an aspect, kind of an aspect of. Notice the qualifiers of confession. Before he dies, he's got to get this off his chest. He's telling Aragorn why what happened happened. The fellowship would not have broken had it not been for Boromir's lust for the ring. Okay? But again, how does the ring work? The ring's pretty close to Mordor at this point. It's trying to get back home. Who does it appeal to? It appeals to the man who back in the, back in the council of Elrond said, let's take the ring and use it. March to victory. So he says, he goes on, they have gone, the halflings, the orcs have taken them. I think they are not dead. Orcs bound them. So it's after he says, I've paid, that he says, oh, by the way, Merry Pippin, they're still alive. The orcs have them. Farewell, Aragorn. Go to Minas Tirith and save my people. I have failed. That's pretty stark language for a hero, for a warrior to use. His whole life has been about what? War and victory. Specifically for? Gondor, Minas Tirith. That's why he's saying, I failed. The I have failed is not just, I tried to take the ring. It's, I cannot go now and protect my homeland. Aragorn, no. You have conquered. Really? How did he conquer? I, in, in modern literature, specifically literature from about 1850 to the present, you have the advent of what's called the unreliable narrator where you cannot trust the narrator to be necessarily telling the truth, okay? Famous example, Herman Melville's Billy but uh, Herman Melville's, not Billy Butt, Bartleby the Scrivener, where the narrator is somebody who lies to us because he doesn't treat this character named Bartleby all that great, and so he's kind of trying to pass, you know, the buck off onto other people. Not in Tolkien. Tolkien belongs to an older generation where you can trust your narrator. Your narrator doesn't mislead you, doesn't tell you falsehoods, all right? So when Aragorn says, no, you have conquered, we are meant to believe that Aragorn truly means you have conquered. So what has he conquered? How? He's seen his mistakes. And he's seen his mistakes. He's recognized them. One more step. He admits them. He owns up to them. That is, it's one thing to know you've done something wrong. It's another thing to do what? Try to fix it or own up to it. Okay? He owns up to it. That's what I think Aragorn is talking about when he says, no, you've conquered. It's not the scores of dead orcs lying around him. Okay? That's why he says, you have conquered few have gained such a victory. Be at peace. What does be at peace mean? Okay, first of all, what is Aragorn? Kind of in hiding, in secret. He's the future king. He's the king in waiting. He's Prince Harry, essentially. Uh, excuse me, William. Okay. So when he says, be at peace, again, I think this is Tolkien's Catholicism coming in. This is the king saying, you are forgiven. You are absolved. You've fessed up, essentially. Okay? Minas Tirith shall not fall. And then that's his promise. Does Aragorn know Minas Tirith won't fall? I mean, has he... Has he read it in the cards? No, he doesn't. He's giving Boromir some last hope with his dying breath. Boromir's dying breath. 
Bormir smiles. Notice, he doesn't die with a grimace on his face. Like we will see in book three, Return of the King, Denethor dies. Denethor dies without any hope at all. Theoden doesn't die without hope. Bormir dies with hope. That's why he has a smile. Aragorn asks, which, uh, which way did they go? <laughs> and was Frodo with them? He's thinking the ring, but Boromir doesn't speak. And this, I think, is probably one of the best things they, you know, Peter Jackson does in the films. When he has Aragorn place that kiss on Boromir's forehead. It's kind of, you know, he's at peace, we're going to let him go. So, Legolas and Gimli come back. Aragorn tells them some of what Boromir said. Notice he doesn't tell them all. Why doesn't he? Why doesn't he let them know Boromir tried to take the ring? He doesn't want them to think ill of Boromir. Think about it. What good would that do? None. But it's the truth. I thought everybody's supposed to know all the truth. It's what our society kind of says. Remember what Aragorn said in the Council of Elrond about protecting people, keeping them free of care and fear? It's kind of the same, kind of the same thing here. He's not keeping Legolas and Gimli free of care and fear, but it's like, let them go on with their memories of Boromir. Um, a couple years ago when my mom died, Couples, some of the members of my extended family, nieces, nephews, that kind of thing. You know, in, a, in an Orthodox funeral service, you've got open casket. And then at the end of the service, kind of depending upon the brand of Orthodoxy, you put the lid on the casket. Well, I built the casket for my mom. And so at the end of the service, people would come up and kind of pay their last respects. Some people kiss the corpse. And after all that, some members of my family didn't want to do that. They wanted their last memories to be of her when she was still alive and didn't look the way she did then. Right? So Bor uh, Aragorn is doing that same kind of thing with them. So they bury Boromir, but they don't really bury him. I'm using that term kind of generically. What kind of funeral does he get? Viking. The only problem with that whole notion of the Viking funeral, you know, Put them on a boat, send them out to sea, get a really good archer, you know, to do that. There's no evidence. There's almost no evidence. Because in terms of archaeological evidence, where would it be? Out in the ocean at the bottom. And it'd be burned, <laughs> most of it. We do have evidence of ship burials. That is, of actual boats being buried in the ground with people in them. Right? Um, look up Sutton Hoo, S-U-T-T-O-N-H-O-O, -O, for the greatest example of a ship burial in England that was discovered in about 1938. So Tolkien was very familiar with this because it was in all the press. And because there's also a ship burial in the old English poem, Beowulf. So they get ready to put them on the ship, send them down over the falls of Rauros, and then each of them sings a song to... The directions of the wind. We get pages 417. Aragorn turns and sings. And he sings to the west wind. Okay. Then Legolas sings to the south wind. Then Aragorn speaks to the north wind. Why aren't they letting the dwarf sing? Does he have a bad voice? No. Aragorn sings and Gimli goes, you left me the east. Well, what's in the east? Mordor. And Aragorn's like, yeah, we're not going to sing about that one. <laughs> we, we don't address that. So they put him in the boat. What do they do with him? They prop him up. They put his broken horn in his lap. And then they pile all the armament of the orcs around him. He has his gifts from Galadriel, you know, nice big wrestling belt buckle. And then we get chapter 2. They follow the orcs who captured Merry and Pippin. 
And they run, 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 and they run. We're going to skip a bunch. Um, let's see here. Several days later, they see, legless sees, what looks to be smoke arising off in the distant plains near the forest of Fangorn. Aragorn and Gimli can't see as well. But then Legolas points out there are riders coming our way. So, page 431, Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli sit down in the grass and they pull those elven cloaks around them. So what happens to them? They're camouflaged. They essentially disappear into the ground. That is, they look like rock. Natural outcroppings of rock. And the riders, well over 100, 120 something, ride past, and it's only when they're about halfway past, that is, this big line of, line of riders is halfway past them, Aragorn jumps up, throws his cloak off, and says, page 431, what news from the north, riders of Rowan? And they quickly circle around them. Whip out their spears. So now that you have 100 plus riders around Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli. They're all horseback, and they're all pointing their spears at them. Page 432. One of the riders says, a tall man, taller than the rest, who are you and what are you doing in this land? Using the common speech of the West, in manner and tone like to the speech of Boromir. That is, this guy sounds like Boromir. Aragorn. I'm called Strider. I come out of the north. I'm hunting orcs. Why doesn't he give his real name? Wouldn't believe him? Possible. Why else? Might be a little intimidating. Possible, but there's over 100 of them, and there's only three here. He doesn't trust them yet. He doesn't know what side they're on. Is there any real neutrality in the War of the Ring? Can you say, well, I'm not supporting Sauron, but I'm not going to oppose him either? No, not really. Okay. So the writer says, at first I thought you were orcs, but now I see you're not. You don't know much about orcs if this is how you hunt them. But Strider, hmm, that's no name for a man that you give, yet it's what he's called up in the north. And strange, too, is your raiment. Have you sprung out of the grass? How did you escape our sight? Are you elvish? No. Well, one of us is. Legless from the woodland realm and distant Mirkwood. But we pass through Lothlorien, and the gifts and favor of the lady go with us. Then there is a lady in the golden wood. Now, pay close attention to the conversation from here out. As old tales tell. What does he mean? As old tales tell. The legends, are true. the legends are true. What's another word for legends <coughs> and old tales? Myths? Fairy tales? Few escape her nets, they say. These are strange days. But if you have her favor, then you also are net weavers and sorcerers. Notice what his old tales tell him. Galadriel is not to be trusted. She's a sorceress. He turns and looks at Legolas and Gimli and says, um, why, don't, why don't you two speak? And you got to love Gimli at this point. Gimli rose, plants his feet firmly apart, all four feet of him. <laughs> Elmer is probably a good 6'2", six 6'3", six plus he's on horseback. So his head's probably, I don't know, about 10 feet off the ground or so. Eight feet off the ground or so. And Gimli says, as for the, uh, sorry, go back up. Give me your name, horse master, and I will give you mine and more besides. In other words, and you are? <laughs> Who are you to demand us, demand of us? Elmer says, the stranger should declare himself first. In other words, this is my property. You're trespassing. 
but I'll answer you. I am named Aelmer, son of Aelmon, and I'm called the third marshal of Rittermark. Then, Aelmer, son of Aelmon, third marshal of Rittermark, you speak evil of that which is fair beyond the reach of your thought, and only little wit can excuse you. Now, what has he just said to Aelmer? You must be stupid to think this was not like awesome. Okay. That's one way of looking at it. Look at his words again. You speak evil of that which is fair beyond the reach of your thought. Your thought is not able to conceive of such beauty as Galadriel. Okay? That's one way of saying you're dimwit. Two, he says, and only little wit can excuse you. And only a low IQ is your answer. So the second part, he says explicitly, you're a dimwit. <laughs> okay. About how many warriors are with him there? Yeah, 100, 120 or so. Aelmer's eyes blazed, and the men of Rowan murmured. They, they understood exactly what Gimli said. I would cut off your head, beard and all, Master Dwarf, if it stood but a little higher from the ground. <laughs> Shut your mouth, midget. <laughs> and what does Legolas do? He stands not alone, bending his bow and fitting an arrow with hands that moved quicker than sight. That is... By the time Legolas finishes saying the word alone, he's got an arrow pointed right at Aelmer. And they're kind of like, oh. <laughs> You would die before your stroke fell. Aelmer raises his sword. Aragorn jumps between them. Your pardon. When you know more, you will understand why you've angered my companions. We intend no evil or Rowan, nor to any of its folk. Neither to man nor to horse. Will you not hear our tale before you strike? Hear us out, please. He says, I will. <laughs> but you shouldn't be so haughty in these dark days. Tell me your right name. I, I know you're really not Strider. Okay? There's got to be something else behind that. Tell me whom you serve. Are you friend or foe of Sauron? I serve only the Lord of the Mark. Notice, uh, next question. <laughs> we do not serve the power of the black land far away, but neither are we yet at open war with him. In other words, we want to be Switzerland. Just leave us alone. But he does say, there is trouble now on all our borders, and we are threatened. We desire, this is what I love about A.O. Mayer and the writers of Rowan, we desire only to be free and to live as we have lived, keeping our own and serving no foreign lord, good or evil. What do the people of Rowan want? To be left alone. Leave us alone. That's all we want. We want to live our lives the way we have. I think, actually, this is Tolkien speaking because of his experiences in World War I. Again, who are you? Whom do you serve? You ask me. <laughs> At whose command do you hunt orcs in our land? Notice what he's implying with those questions. There's somebody above you. Whose orders are you following? And Aragorn says, I serve no man but the servants of Sauron I pursue into whatever land they may go. Border shorters, <laughs> he is saying. I go wherever I want. This is kind of like, you know, if you want to talk about the war on terror, our troops, whether they're in Afghanistan or Pakistan, saying, we don't care about any imaginary border between the two stands. Those borders are, by the way, completely fake. They were invented in the 20th century. Okay? Aragorn's saying, whither orcs go, I will follow them. There are few among mortal men who know more of orcs, and I do not hunt them in this fashion out of choice. They took two of my friends. We're following them. He says, I am not weaponless. And then he throws back his cloak, you know, in very dramatic fashion, I think, and whips out his sword. And look at the description. Aragorn threw back his cloak. This is two, 
four, what is it? Four or thirty-three. Throws back his cloak. The elven sheath glittered as he grasped it, and the bright uh, blade of Anduril shone like a sudden flame as he swept it out. Notice, it didn't turn into flame. It shone, or shone like the flame. He catches the glint of the sun's rays right off of it. And what are we told? Elendil, he cries. I am Aragorn, son of Arathorn, and am called. Elisar, the Elfstone, Dunad, the heir of Isildur, Elendil, son of Gondor. Here is the sword that was broken and is forged again. Will you aid me or thwart me? Choose swiftly. Does Aomer get his question answered? Yeah. yeah, and then a whole bunch more. Okay? Because he not only says, well, my name is Aragorn, son of Arathorn, but I'm descended from King Arthur. And this is Excalibur. That's what he's saying in our world's kind of mythology. Gimli and Legolas look at their companion in amazement, for they had not seen him in this mood before. He seemed to have grown in stature while Amir had shrunk. And in his living face, they caught a brief vision of the power and majesty of the kings of stone. Remember the kings of stone? They're sailing down the river, and when they park at Parth Galen, they've gone past these two big towers. Statues of stone of Elendil and Isildur. Okay? And then for a moment, it seemed to the eyes of Legolas, top of 434, that a white flame flickered on the brows of Aragorn like a shining crown. That's why he's called Elfstone. The stone that Legolas thinks he sees for a moment. What is that? It's the Silmaril. It's the same Silmaril that Irondale has up in the sky that shone down on Galadriel's mirror. Okay? Amr steps back with a look of awe in his eyes. And what else does he do? He casts down his eyes. In other words, he doesn't look Aragorn in the face. He looks down. Why? Such majesty is not to be seen. This is kind of like, kind of like, seeing Glorfindel as he is on the other side. They are seeing a little glimpse of the majesty Aragorn will have when he is king. Dreams and legends spring to life out of the grass. What did Boromir say when he saw the sword that was broken thrown on the table? He talks about the shadows of the past. Aragorn is that. <laughs> He's a walking, living, breathing shadow. He's like somebody out of fairy tale walking right into the present. Tell me, Lord. Lord, not just tell me, Aragorn. Can I just call you Air? <laughs> He's now speaking to him with respect. What brings you here? And what was the meaning of the dark words? Long has Boromir, son of Denethor, been gone seeking an answer. What doom do you bring out of the north? He knows the riddle. The doom of choice. What does Aragorn mean? Every choice is what? Every decision is what? It's a judgment. It's a doom. You make a decision, what happens to the options that existed prior to the decision being made? They're gone. You can't redo them. The doom of choice. Say this to Theoden. Open war lies before him, with Sauron or against him. In other words, you can't be neutral here. None may live now as they have lived. Your little plot of land will not keep you safe. He said, but we'll talk about this later. Now I'm in great need. What can you tell us of our friends? Orcs are dead. And our friends didn't find any. Well, that's strange. Did you search? <laughs> Did you search the slang? Um, they're kind of like children. Dressed like us. No dwarves nor children, we counted all the slain and despoiled them. That is, we took all their armor, we took all their swords. 
Gimli. We're not talking about dwarves or children. They're hobbits. Hmm, what's that? Halflings, Gimli says. And he says, oh, you mean like in the riddle? And a writer says, halflings. Halflings, but they're only a little people, what? In old songs and children's tales out of the north. Leprechauns, they're just things out of tales of the north. Fairies, elves. Do we walk in legends or on the green earth in the daylight? He's essentially saying, what is real? Well, Aragorn just pulled the sword out of his sheath and said what? This is the sword that Isildur used to cut off Sauron's finger. This is the sword borne by Elendil. Right? Like I've said many times, this is like an archaeologist today discovering Excalibur or the tomb of Arthur, finding it empty. <laughs> Aragorn, a man may do both. That is, you can walk in legends and in the green earth of daylight. For not we, but those who come after will make the legends of our time. <coughs> You know, we talk about those men who scaled the cliffs of Normandy as being part of the greatest generation. Do you think, as they were climbing those cliffs under gunfire, that they were thinking, well, hell, you know, 40 years from now, people are going to call us the greatest generation? No. What were they thinking? Damn, that one was close. <laughs> Don't get shot, stupid. Aragorn is saying, we can all be the stuff of legends. Why? We don't say the legends. We don't make the legends. It's those who come after us that make the legends and the myths and the stories about what we did. I mean, just think of the legends, the stories that will come out of, you know, all the people who took boats to Houston. Okay? And the lives that were saved, not from FEMA, or not by FEMA, not by the National Guard, but by common, everyday, ordinary people. Okay? Or the people I was reading an article yesterday, folks in Puerto Rico, you know, which got hit pretty bad by Hurricane Irma, who were taking boats and going to the U.S. Virgin Islands because they got hit worse. The green earth, say you? That is a mighty matter of legend, though you tread it under the light of day. What's he mean? Though you take it for granted. He's saying, open your eyes, buddy. You don't even really see the green earth. This is Tolkien's idea of recovery. See the real world. The writer, time's pressing, Lord. We, we, we got appointments to be at. Amor says, shush. <laughs> Peace, Aethan. Okay. So he tells, he and Aragorn talk a little bit. Aragorn says, I set out from Imladris. Notice he uses the word that Elmer would know from the riddle. He says, we went with Bormir. Alas, he has fallen. Gandalf has fallen. Shadowfax made um, her way back home, or his way back home. Can't remember Shadow effects is male or female. Anyways, page 437. They keep talking. Elmer says, the dorks are all dead. We didn't find anything that looked like them. And Aragorn says at the bottom of that page, I thank you for your fair words, and my heart desires to come with you, but I cannot desert my friends while hope remains. Elmer, there is no hope. Well, why does Aragorn say there is hope? Okay, that's one reason. Why else? They didn't have any bodies. No bodies. Unless you show me their bodies, there is still hope. You will not find your friends on the northern border. But they're not behind us either, he says. We found a token not far from the east wall. Who dropped that token, by the way? Pippin? 
He got free for just a moment, pulled the brooch off and dropped it. I think it was Pippin by the size of the footprints, because he's smaller. Page 48, 438, they keep talking. Aragorn tells them, they were dressed like us. You might have missed them. Yeah, I forgot that. The world, page 438, right in the middle. The world is all grown strange, Elmer says. Elf and dwarf and company walk in our daily fields, and, and folk speak with the lady of the wood and yet live, and the sword comes back to war that was broken in the long ages, ere the fathers of our fathers rode into the mark. In other words, the sword that was broken before there was any Rohan. How shall a man judge what to do in such times? How do I know what is good or ill when everything gets turned upside down? Aragorn, as he has ever judged. Why? Tolkien's religious and philosophical ideas working their way in. Good and ill have not changed since yesteryear. Nor are they one thing among elves and dwarves and another among men. What has Aragorn just said? There is, or there are, absolutes. Notwithstanding what, who is it, Obi-Wan says it? In the God of whatever it would, one of the prequels, you know. Only a Sith speaks in absolutes. What did he just do? He spoke in an absolute. Is Obi-Wan saying, therefore, he's a secret Sith? Okay. There is good and evil. Everything is not merely a shade of gray, Aragorn is saying. And notice what else he says. Good isn't just what is good for men. And therefore it's different for elves and dwarves. Again, this is Tolkien's ideology coming through. What's he saying? Some cultures are better than others. Period. He's essentially saying, Aragorn's kind of saying, our Western, that is in the Lord of the Rings, Culture is better than who else's culture? Who are they chasing? Orcs. The culture of dwarves, elves, and men is morally superior to the culture of orcs. How do you know? What will orcs do to each other willingly and easily? That takes men a little bit more time to get to. Kill and eat. See, humans generally aren't known for being cannibals. From California, I know all about the Donner Party. <laughs> you know, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer and people like him are what? The exception to the rule. Orcs? No. You fry up Gorbag over there for a nice tasty dinner. It is a man's part to discern them. Discern good and evil. As much in the golden wood that is in the land of the elves as in his own house. To discern, to know good from evil. What's Aragorn saying? He's saying, look at me, Aylmer. Tell me, am I good or evil? Is Gimli good or evil? Is Legolas good or evil? Is serving Sauron good or evil? Is attempting to be neutral, good or evil. So I'm saying, well, I'm saying, Tolkien's suggesting there is no neutrality. It's not, well, I'm going to be mostly good and, you know, dabble in evil. I'm not talking, you know, somebody can choose to be absolutely good all the time. It's not what he's suggesting. Amher says, true indeed, I don't doubt you, nor the deed which my heart would do. That is, yeah, I'll give you horses. <laughs> Yet I am not free to do all as I would. Why isn't he free? Yeah? Because he has a Lord. He has somebody he answers to. He's in a different position than Aragorn is, right? Who does Aragorn answer to? <laughs> Himself? His own awareness of this? Is there a Lord higher than him? No, not really. He doesn't even answer to Elrond. Elrond's not his boss. Now, 
He sucks up to Elrond, if you want to say that, because he wants to marry his daughter. So he's got to please, you know, future daddy-in-law. By the way, what must Aragorn do in order to wed Arwen? We talked about the story of Baron and Luthien, right? What must Baron do? Cut a Silmaril from the crown of Morgoth and deliver it in his hand to um, Thingol, Luthien's father. He dies in the attempt. But when they cut open the big wolf's mouth that holds his hand, his hand is then handed to Thingol to say, did it. Okay, you know, Baron's almost dead at that point. He gets healed. Aragorn has got to be king of Gondor, and Sauron has got to be defeated. So you got to defeat Sauron, and then get sworn in as king of Gondor. And only then can you marry my daughter. Kind of, you know, he's aiming really high here. <laughs> yeah. So he tells Aragorn, you know, there's laws against doing what you want me to do. He says, I don't think your law was made for this situation. Nor indeed am I a stranger. I've been in this land in, before more than once. I've ridden with the hosts of the Rohirrim. I've not seen you before because you're young, but I've spoken with your father and with Theoden. In other words, I, I know you're king. We're on speaking terms. Never in former days would any high lord of this land have constrained a man to abandon such a quest as mine. He goes, but my duty is clear, so you've got to decide. Are you going to help me or hinder me? If you hinder me, you're going to lose a lot of men. Because we're not going to go down, you know, willingly. So, Aylmer gives him horses. So we're going to skip a bunch after that. They go to Fangorn. They go to the site of the battle. Okay. And pages 441. Uh, make a fire... And they see an old man on the edge of the forest who flees when they call him. Chapter 3, so that's the first two chapters deal with Aragorn, Legolas, Gimli, and the burial, there was the death of Boromir. Then Tolkien takes us to Merry and Pippin. And where do we go to? We go back to when they were captured. And he's going to do this kind of throughout this book. So we see Pippin escape and drop off the thing. And we get to chapter whatever that is, Treebeard, chapter 4. They escape from the orcs. They make off for Fangorn. They go in, and they climb up a little hill to where there's a clearing. And they look out over the clearing, page 463. And Mary says, the wind's changing. It's turned east again. It feels cool up here. Pippin, yes. I'm afraid this is only a passing gleam, and it will all go gray again. A passing gleam. What is this passing gleam meant to do for Mary and Pippin? It's a little, little mini eucatastrophe. It gives them hope. That's why he says, it will all go gray again. What a pity. The shaggy old forest looks so different in the sunlight. I almost felt I liked the place. And then Treebeard introduces himself. Now, the character of Treebeard and his mannerisms and speech are based on Tolkien's, at the time he wrote this, very good friend, C.S. Lewis, who had a booming, deep voice. Okay? So, they talk with Treebeard. They tell Treebeard what happened to Gandalf. And he says, you speak about Gandalf in the past tense. And they say, page 466, did, did you know Gandalf? Again, notice, past tense. And he says, yes, I do know him. Present tense. He's the only wizard who really cares about trees. And they mention how he fell. He's like, well, that's surprising. So they go off to Treebeard's home with him. And as they go, they talk about Saruman. Page 473, Treebeard tells them, Sir Man is plotting to become a power. That is, he wants to be like Sauron. They finally make it to his home. And 
They drink from his int draft. Intriguer orders or organizes calls, however you want to put it. An int moot, a meeting of the ints. Why? To talk about what to do with Saruman. This is kind of like a, within the int world, a meeting of the National Security Council at the UN. Does Treebeard think anything's going to happen as of this moot? Does he think the Ents will actually do anything? No, he doesn't. But they do. They decide quickly to march on Isengard and put an end to Sauron. Right? So we see them march on Isengard, and night falls over Isengard as the Ents are all looking at Isengard. And what does Tolkien do? He takes us back to, where is he? The White Rider. We see Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli. They're in Fangorn now. And page 491, Legolas says, I feel young again as I have not felt since I journeyed with you children. He says, I can be happy here. Gimli, not me. <laughs> You're a wood elf, yet you comfort me. Where you go, I will go. What has happened to Legolas and Ghibli? No, this isn't a homoerotic affair, between, as some people want to argue, or interspecies erotic affair, whatever. They become bros. Yeah. They become very close friends, such close friends that they each swear, Legolas says, I will explore the glittering caves of Helm's Deep with you, and you'll come with me, and we'll explore... Fangorn. Because keep in mind, what relationship did the elves and dwarves have prior to the fellowship being created? Yeah, like white nationalists and um, NAACP did not get along very well. They hated each other, in other words. Okay? So, they're still there. They're walking around. And as they're making their way, trying to follow the signs that Treebeard makes when he walks, which you can imagine is probably significant, they see the old man off in the forest again. And as he's walking, his cloak kind of moves away, and they see he's all in white. Gimli cries, page 494, Sarah man, speak, tell us where you have hidden our friends. The old man's too quick. He jumps up onto a rock and he throws aside his gray rags and hood. His white garments shone. He lifted up his staff and Gimli's axe, this is the bottom of 494, and Gimli's axe leaped from his grasp and fell ringing on the ground. Aragorn's sword stiffened his motionless hand, blazed with a sudden fire, and Legolas gives a great shout and shoots an arrow into the air. Who's the first one to recognize him? Legolas. Mithrandir, he cries. The name Gandalf is known by among the elves. Well met, Legolas. And they look at him in Aragorn. Gandalf. Beyond all hope, you return to us in our need. That's the definition of a new catastrophe. It is a sudden and miraculous grace never to be counted on to recur. I mean, how often do people come back from the dead? Not very. Within the Lord of the Rings? Once. <laughs> what veil was over my sight? Gandalf. He goes, yeah, I did used to be called Gandalf, didn't I? And Gimli says, but, but you're all in white. What was Saruman the last time Gandalf saw him? Sarah man of many colors. See, now Gandalf is white. Yes, I am white now. Indeed, I am Sarah man, one might almost say. Sarah man as he should have been. I passed through fire and deep water since we parted. I've forgotten much that I thought I knew and learned again much that I had forgotten. So, they keep talking as such. I'm going to skip a bit. Page 499. 
Gandalf tells them, Merry and Pippin are with Treebeard and the Ents. They are with the Ents? Then there is truth in the old legends about the dwellers in the deep forest and the giant shepherds of the trees. Okay. Same kind of language Elmer used when he met Aragorn. Oh, you mean so the old fairy tales are true? Aragorn is an old fairy tale. He should not find this so hard to believe. Are there still ints in the world? I thought they were only a memory of ancient days. If indeed they were ever more than a legend of Rowan. Legolas. Legend of Rowan? No. Every elf in Wilderland has sung songs for the Onagrim and their long sorrow. What's their long sorrow? The ant wives went off. And the ants longed to find them again. Why? Because the ants are dying out. So Gandalf says, Treebeard is Fangorn, the guardian of the forest. He's the oldest of the ants, the oldest living, the oldest living thing that still walks beneath the sun upon this middle earth. Why is there not a footnote there? Or an asterisk with a footnote or asterisk at the bottom of the page? What about Tom Bombadil? Or is he said living thing? Is Tom Bombadil dead? Okay, that was going exactly what I was going to get at. Maybe Tom Bombadil, Tom Bombadil, is kind of of a different order of existence. Who are you, alone, nameless, yourself? In other words, as I kind of suggested before, I think Tom Bombadil is true existence, manifestation of Iluvatar. So they keep talking, and Legolas says, so are we not going to see the merry young hobbits again? The happy-go-lucky, frivolous, flighty, air-heady hobbits. Gandalf says, I didn't say so. Be patient. We're going to meet up again, but we've got to go kind of a roundabout way. So, page 501. They look at Gandalf. Or excuse me, Legolas and Gimli look at Aragorn and Gandalf. The gray figure of the man, Aragorn, son of Arathorn, was tall and stern as stone, his hand upon the hilt of his sword. He looked as if some king out of the mist of the sea had stepped upon the shores of lesser men. Before him stooped the old figure, white, shining now as if, as if with some light kindled within, bent, laden with years, but holding a power beyond the strength of kings. And Aragorn says, Do I not say truly you could go with us wherever you wish quicker than I? And this I also say, You are a captain in our banner. The Dark Lord has nine, but we have one, mightier than they, the White Rider. Okay? So they get Gandalf to tell them what happened when he fell at the bridge of Khazad Dun. And he says, We fell, we fell, and fell, and fell, and fell, and fell, and fell, fell all the way down to the bottom of. The roots of the mountain splashed in water, put out the fire of the Balrog. We came out, got on the dim rail stair, and he burst into flame again. Page 502. He says, we climbed to the top of the mountain, burst out onto the top of the mountain. Right in the middle of the page, I threw down my enemy, and he fell from the high place and broke the mountainside where he smote it in his ruin. This is almost exactly the language that's used, I can't remember which, I think it's Daniel, in either Daniel or Ezekiel, about Satan being thrown out of heaven. He hits the earth and smote it in his ruin. Then darkness took me, and I strayed out of thought and time, and I wandered far on roads that I will not tell. What does it mean to stray out of thought and time? First of all, how do you stray out of time? Some place where time is not. Where is that? When you're dead. Okay. Death. There is no time in death. Okay. Out of thought, nobody's thinking about them. Naked, I was sent back for a brief time until my task is done. 
Sent back implies what? Louder? Okay. Brought back to life. What else? There's a sender. Somebody said, you got to go back. But he comes back, he says, naked. Does that mean physically he doesn't have any clothes on? That's one meaning of it. He's kind of a blank slate. Possible. What's another meaning of naked that doesn't apply clothing? Like when someone is naked before the eye of Sauron. What does Sauron see? Everything. The soul? See, I think what Gandalf is saying here is, I was sent back without a body. And naked I lay upon the mountaintop. That's referring to naked, no clothing. Okay, he's on the top of a mountain, pretty tall mountain, where there's ice and snow. He's cold. And what happens? Gwai here, the wind lord, discovers him. And he's taken to Galadriel. Well, why is Gwai here, the wind lord, there? Because Galadriel sent him. When, when they showed up in Lothlorien and said, oh, by the way, Gandalf's dead. He fell at the bridge of Khazad-dûm, she goes, no, Gandalf, no, not really. He <laughs> calls Gwai here. So he's sent back naked, but then he gets clothed. He gets clothed in white garments. Why? I could be grasping at straws here, but I think, again, this is part of Tolkien's religious and philosophical ideas. The book of Revelation says, to those who overcome, they will be granted a white robe. Well, what did he overcome? Death. Okay. And new body. Can Gandalf now, quote unquote, kind of be killed in his new body? I don't think so. I, I, I don't think anything can harm him. Okay. So, um, Gandalf relates to them words from the Lady Galadriel. She tells Legolas, don't get so close to the sea that you hear the cry of the gull. She tells to Aragorn, look for the paths of the dead, essentially. And Gimli's like, she, she didn't think of me. She, she never thinks of me. And he's kicking his feet in the dirt. And Gandalf says, oh yeah, that's right. To Gimli, son of Bowen, page 503, give his ladies greeting. Lock bearer, wherever thou goest, my thought goes with thee. But lay your axe to the right tree. And Gimli starts singing and dancing a jig. I mean, Tolkien actually says he capers around. Why? She's thinking of me. <laughs> <laughs> He's got it bad, man. He's got it really bad for Galadriel. Okay, so we then get chapter 6. King of the Golden Hall. I always forget to do this. Hold on real quickly. Um, Aragorn runs, sings these lines. Where now the horse and the rider? Where is the horn that was blowing? This is what's called the ubi sunt motif. It's Latin for where are. There's an old English poem called The Wanderer that has a passage in it, beginning line 92. <coughs> line 92 and following that has the Ubisunt motif. So Aragorn sings, Where now the horse and the rider? Where is the horn that was blowing? Where is the helm and the hauberk and the bright hair flowing? Where is the hand on the harp string and the red fire glowing? Where is the spring and the harvest and the tall corn growing? Now I think it's in the um, extended edition DVD version. You get Aragorn singing this, and he sings it in the language of Rowan, which is Old English, which sounds somewhat like this. This is these lines from The Wanderer. 
Where upon Mary? Where upon Margo? Where upon Margo Giva? Where upon Simla Nisetu? Where is Sindan Sela Dramas? That is, where is the horse? Where is the rider? Where, are the, where is the treasure giver? Where is the great feast? Where are the hall joys? Very similar to what Aragorn sings here. Okay? So they get to Adaras. And they're all asked to leave their weapons outside. Why? This is an Anglo-Saxon slash Germanic motif. What happens when you get a bunch of people armed to the hill inside the mead hall where there's lots of beer being passed around? Yeah. Well, mine's better than yours. And they start killing each other. Okay? So Gandalf says... You're not going to make an old man leave his crutch behind. I'll sit out here and Theoden can come out to me. So how about the door warden goes, go on, you can go on in. So they get inside and we see this image, this vignette almost, of Theoden sitting in his throne. He's all hunched over. Okay. Dream a worm tongue behind him or at his feet. And... Page 512. Behind his chair stood a woman clad in white, and at his feet upon the steps sat a wise and figure of a man with a pale, wise face. So they speak, and we hear Worm Tongue say some things. <coughs> and Worm Tongue warns Theoden about Gandalf. And finally, page 514, Gandalf's had enough, and he says, The wise speak only of what they know, Grima, son of Galmod, a witless worm have you become. Therefore be silent and keep your forked tongue behind your teeth. I have not passed through fire and death, he makes it clear there, to bandy crooked words with a serving man. He raises his staff, cue the special effects, thunder, lightning, the whole hall becomes suddenly dark as night. And Gandalf speaks directly to Theoden. Do you ask for help? He lifts his staff, he points to a high window. So they're now in the hall. Is this this great shining hall made of gold, paved with beautiful stone? No, it's an Anglo-Saxon Germanic hall. It's made of wood. It's thatched with straw. It does have a window up in the roof. And Gandalf points to that window and a little beam of light comes in. And he says, not all is dark. But if you're not looking at that beam of light and you look around the rest of the hall, what is it? Pitch black. Notice, not all is dark. Most of it is. Gandalf's not lying here. Take courage, Lord of the Mark, for better help you will not find. No counsel have I to give to those that despair. Counsel I could give, will you hear my words? Theoden slowly gets up out of his chair. And notice, as he rises... A faint light grew in the hall again. Is that because Gandalf is using his staff to turn the dimmer switch up, 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 up? No. The hall is becoming light because Theoden is coming to himself. Look at the difference between what we see here and what we see in the damnable film. <laughs> what does Gandalf do to Theoden? Basically, he's like forcing Sarah out of him or whatever. Points his staff at him. He's like... <laughs> And what do you see in Theoden? You see the face of Saruman, who has possessed him. Utterly ludicrous. So, Theoden goes outside, and he looks on his land. Page 515. From the porch upon the top of the high terrace, they could see beyond the stream the green fields of Rowan fading into distant gray. Curtains of windblown rain were slanting down. The sky above and to the west was still dark with thunder. Lightning far away flickered among the tops of hidden hills. But the wind had shifted to the north. And already the storm that had come out of the east, okay, so they're facing south. The storm coming out of the east is blown over. Why? Because a breeze had come from the north. Gandalf, Aragorn, 
Legless Gimli, they've all come out of the north from Rivendell. Okay? The breeze mimics them. And the storm is rolling away. This is a little bit of foreshadowing. And what happens? Suddenly, through a rent in the clouds behind them, a shaft of sun stabbed down. The falling showers gleamed like silver, and far away the river glittered. And what does Theoden say? It is not so dark here. That is another little example of a natural, that is, caused by nature, eucatastrophe. That, that ray of sunlight not only illuminates the world outside, it pierces the darkness in Theoden. And Gandalf says, no, it's not so dark, nor does age lie so heavily on your shoulders as some would have you think. Throw away your prop. As some would have you think, what has Wormtongue been whispering in its ear for years? old and decrepit. And what happens after somebody tells you something over and over and over again for years, possibly decades, you believe it. Take two children, take two newborns, do this for a psychology experiment. Probably wouldn't be able to get IRB approval, but you know, <laughs> what the hell, give it a shot. Take two newborns, place one in a home where the parents say to that child every day, I love you, you will succeed, you can be whatever you want to be. Place the other one in a home where the parents say, I hate you, you're a sorry pack of shit, you'll never amount to anything. Have those two children raised in those two homes for 20 years. What are those children going to be like when they each reach the age of 20? This one's going to be a go-getter, type A personality, who will succeed in almost everything, and this one probably won't live till 20 because they will have been shot <laughs> for either breaking the law or doing something bad. Okay? Is it the power of positive thinking? In a very trite, simplistic sense, you can say yes. So, Theoden comes out, and we're told that he says... Dark have been my dreams of late, but I feel as one new awakened. We have recovery. <laughs> we have escape. Only thing is, he's really escaped. He's escaped the darkness that warm tongue had woven around him. Okay? So, warm tongue gets the boot. Notice, is he thrown in jail to rot? Is he executed? No. Nope. What's he given? A horse. Louder? A horse if he's been eaten. Okay. Before then, and before the exile. Uh, he's given a choice. He's given a choice. Serve me loyally and faithfully, or run back to your real master. Your choice. And he chooses to go back to Saruman. Okay, we've only got a minute left. Um... Where you get, and we won't talk about it today, we'll, start, we'll get this done on Thursday. Chapter 7, Helm's Deep, nine pages. Okay? Excuse me, the chapter is 16 pages. The battle is actually only nine pages out of the entire second volume. And yet it becomes one of the major components of the film. But we'll talk about... We'll pick up there on Thursday. I think we might still be able to finish. If not, we won't be too far behind. All right, that's all.